figure that out in a second. Have you noticed that everything in your closet, have you noticed that everything in your closet has shrunk? I was saying that to Terry this morning. Everything in my closet has shrunk. How did that happen? It must have been wet in there or something. 
Now you may not have known that song, and you know how I feel about worship. I've told you this before, even before you knew me as well as you might know me now. Uh, familiarity breeds worship, right? Until you're familiar with it, it's hard to sing it from your heart because you're just struggling with the, uh, the tune. So we've introduced this one a few weeks ago and we've sung it a few times together. What I would love it if you would do as we sing the goodness of God, that you would just allow this to, to melt down into your soul this morning. It says so many things that are right, so many things that are powerful and strong. I love you, Lord. Your mercy never fails me. That's a truth that you need to be saying often. The chorus says, all my life, you've been faithful. Reminded that your goodness runs after us, pursues us. We'd be quick to admit that life isn't without its challenges. But Lord, we're constantly reminded, not just from your word, but from our own life, that you are with us every step. 
you're in the midst of those things that cause us to pause. In fact, sometimes you use those things to cause us to pause. To remind us that we're not anything without you. We may have talents, we may have gifts, we may have things that we can share with others, but without you, not very much. So Lord, we surrender to you, you who can move mountains, you who can bring light to the dark places. We ask, Lord, that wherever we might find ourselves today, in whatever situation we might find ourselves today, that you would meet us right there because your goodness pursues us. Lord, we pray for those in our congregation today who are not with us at this place, but are in other places, and we ask that you'll watch over them. Lord, for those members of our families who need your special touch today in their lives, for whatever the reason, whether they're ill or they're injured, whether they're struggling, or whether they're celebrating. Lord, will you be with them and with us, we pray. This morning at the end of the service, we're going to refer to Revelation chapter 4, verse 10. And I'm sure you can quote that, right? I couldn't either. I'm just messing with you. But, uh, but it's, about, it's about crowns. It's about crowns. And um, I don't know if you've ever had a crown, other than the one that disappeared on the back of my head as I got older. Uh, but, but, I don't know, but you will have. And that's what we're going to talk about at the end of the sermon today. That you're going to have a crown. Well, what are we going to do with that thing? I don't know what I would do with it if I had it, but uh, if you had a crown, what would you do with it? Well, this is a suggestion that comes from Revelation chapter 4, verse 10. So we'll refer to that end of the service. But here's, uh, here's a song. Now, I'm pretty sure that you've probably heard this because, again, it, it comes from uh, the mid-90s. Uh, from that uh, pool of songs that uh, was sung then. But just in case, we're going to practice it. Okay? I'll be so glad when you take those masks off and I can actually see if you're, you know, angry or happy or... <laughs> okay. Roger and I have been practicing this this morning. Here's how it goes. Oh, Jesus. 
thank you, Sylvia, for that uh, beautiful piece. If you have your Bible, as you know, in whatever format you like to bring, bound in a book, captured and electronically in your phone, uh, however you want to, uh, to grab a hold of that uh, Bible, pull it out, pull out, turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. Now, if you're reading forward, you're going to notice that there are some things that are lining up with that season that is upon us of Advent. Uh, the week before Advent starts, not a bad time to be talking about shepherds, or at least getting that into our minds. Uh, the first week of Advent, not a bad time to be talking about humility, uh, because as you know, the event we want to uh, refer to throughout the Christmas season, the manger, was a rather humbling event for our Lord. So, not a bad time to be talking about all of these things, I would say. But if you're in your scripture, you want to uh, turn to chapter 5 of 1 Peter, uh, verse 1. We're just going to look at the first four verses this morning. Peter writes and he says, The elders who are among you, I exhort. I, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but as being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Let's take a moment and pray. Lord, as we just allow these words to, to work through our our, our, our experience, as we allow these words to just uh, filter through the things that we are and that we have and that we've brought to this moment, I pray that your Spirit will be the one speaking, that your Holy Spirit will be the one that resonates deep down inside of us as to what needs to be said in our hearts today. Pray that sincerely in Jesus' name. Amen. As I was studying for this uh, sermon this morning, my mind traveled back to 1984. Now, I know that was quite some time ago, but you can I want you to kind of relate with me, if you would. As a 20-something young person, I thought, uh, here I was, and I know, I know how much you you, probably just as much as I love, to hear uh, Salvation Army officer training college stories. You don't want to hear that stuff, right? It's... <sighs> but I remember coming to the end of that training college time and being appointed to this little place that I'd never been to called Pembroke, Ontario. And my mind jumped right straight back to Pembroke, Ontario, and our first Sunday there, and I could almost, not almost, I could see the place if I close my eyes. I could see the people who were gathered, fewer than you are this morning, even in the midst of COVID, less people. I can remember, sorry, the smell of the building. I can remember it because when I walk in a building that smells sort of the same, I can remember. But you know what stuck out the biggest in my mind? What in the world? am I doing here? I'm 20-something, and I've been dropped into this small town in northern Ontario, and I'm supposed to lead this group of people. Whoa, I'm going to need some help. I'm going to need some help. I got lots of help from, you won't believe it, but the elderly people in the congregation. You see, I wasn't the first new officer, or Sue and I weren't the first new officers to be appointed to Pembroke. They'd finished lots of officers' training, they told me. Uh, they, they saw that as their ministry. They received new officers, and they, quote, finished their training. I'll tell you, the finishing of the training was tougher than the training. 
it was tougher because they put you through the paces. Now, if, if a certain person named Pat is listening to our online recording this morning, I apologize, but Pat's mom could make you cry. She could. And I think it was part of the finishing of the training part that she was, she could make you cry. She could, she, she had this gift of really just getting to your heart, you know, and upsetting you and telling you things that maybe you didn't want to hear, but you know what? You kind of needed to hear, probably. I want you to look at the first two words of this morning's text that says, the elders. Now, you can take this a couple of ways if you like. Certainly you can take it the way you, could, you take it if you've got your stained glass reading goggles on, right? The elders, well, of course, that means the leaders in the church. So I can check out, I don't need to even read this if I'm not a leader in the church. Sorry, it could mean that. But it also could mean people who are older. No rocket science here, okay? The elders are the people who are older. Older than what? Well, in Pembroke, it was older than me in mid-20s. But let me give you a third translation for elders. It's people who are experienced. You could be 15 and be experienced in some things, couldn't you? So I don't think... Even though the first two words of the text are elders, it lets any of us off the hook this morning. And I want to tell you that it's a whole lot easier for me to relate to what Peter's saying now than it was almost 40 years ago in February. Because he says, to the elders who are among you, so let's, let's make it local. So to the elders who are among us here in this place, Peter says, I exhort. When you get an exhortation, that's a that's an encouragement. That's, that's somebody saying to you, hey, you've got this awesome thing to do. Let me help you get about the business of doing it. That's the kind of encouragement that Peter was bringing to the elders in the church that we've been thinking about since the summertime. The dispersed church. Go back to the first chapter. It's to the diaspora, the Christians that were dispersed here and there in various communities doing their thing in various communities. Can you relate to that? Are you a Christian that's transplanted into your community and there aren't a whole lot of other Christians around you? We are. You live in the same town as us. I'll bet you are too. <laughs> Unless you live at training college where they're all Christians. Boy, that was tough. I'll tell you, that was tough. Getting to working it out with other Christians. Wow, I think I'd rather be in the community many days. It was hard. So all of us relate to this, and what Peter is bringing to us today is says, okay, you experienced people, you elders, and then I love what he says. He says, I am a fellow elder. Now, we haven't had a whole lot of time to unpack with all of us here in the room uh, how, how Sue and I lead congregations, but I hope you're getting it now. I hope you're getting it by now. We're not gonna stand up on a pedestal in any way, not to say that that's wrong, I suppose. I want to be on the floor. I want to be with us. I want us to be together. That's what I want. And I'm going to follow everything that I'm going to tell you this morning. So as a fellow elder, and that's, you need to study Peter a little bit, that's how he led. That's how he led. He never ever put himself up above anyone. He led from the floor. He led as a shepherd in the group. He says, I'm a fellow elder along with you all. <laughs> Be careful my southern disposition doesn't come out, y'all. Along with you all, I'm a fellow elder. And a witness, he says, of some very important things that you are also a witness of. Now, Peter had a slight advantage over us in that he had physically witnessed the things that he's going to talk about here in a moment. You and I have not physically witnessed those things, but we have read about them. Every time we open the Bible, it's a thread that runs through the whole Bible, but he says, I am a witness with you of the sufferings of Christ. 
Like I said, we weren't there physically at Calvary, Peter was. But we've read about it. And if you don't understand it, you can read it some more. If you don't understand it, you can come and talk to somebody in our congregation, fellow elders that can talk to each other. If you still don't understand it, you can get a commentary. If you still don't understand it, well, even five steps before that, let's talk. The sufferings of Christ. Right in this letter from 1 Peter, he's explained to us how we should associate with the, with the sufferings of Christ. He suffered for you. Not you. You and you and you. He suffered for us individually. That suffering that he endured on the cross was for you personally. So he says, I'm a fellow elder, I'm a fellow witness of the sufferings of Christ, and I'm also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. As I prepared for today, I got to thinking that we in the Salvation Army have never really, preachers that I know of at least, have never really spent a lot of time talking about end time. Now, you may have had a preacher or two come, and, and they're very schooled in, in Revelation and those kinds of things. I'm probably not that guy. I, I think it has a lot to do with our, our mission as the Salvation Army is very immediate, isn't it? We spend a lot of time working on the immediate, and we may not spend quite enough time working on the ultimate. I, I kind of get that feeling. But what he says about being partakers of the glory that will be revealed, what he's telling us is that when you meet Christ face to face, and you will as a Christian, as a believer, the glory will overtake you. You won't be able to contain yourself. You might only have a couple words on your tongue, and we already sung them this morning. Holy, holy, holy. Overcome in the presence of the Lord. I don't know that in this era we're so good at thinking about when we read about the glory that will be revealed. We've lived, all of us in this room, through the, the era of video, haven't we? It doesn't really, you know, seeing words that, that are written on a page, I am a partaker of the glory that will re be revealed, doesn't really jazz us too much, does it? Make a video, please, right? Make me a video, then I can maybe relate. Because we live in this, this image world where we see pictures of everything. So it's a bit of a struggle, but I believe it's a struggle that you're gonna need to work through. That when Christ appears, you will be overcome. You may even find yourself on your knees with not many words to say. And that's how Peter relates to us this morning. He says, we, we who are, are experienced in the faith, we who are experienced in the faith, he says, I am also experienced in the faith. And we are all, we are all witnesses of what Christ has done for us, and we will all be partakers of that glory which will be revealed. So we're on the same page with Peter. I read this passage kind of like, Kind of like a job posting. If you look at it kind of like a job posting. Have you ever, when was the last time you applied for a job? A couple days ago, I'll bet for some of you. Uh, some jobs we get, we don't even apply for. But, but the last time you applied for the job, you, you look at the job posting and it lists the qualifications. Well, I've just gone through the qualifications. You're experienced. You've got a, you're, you're, a, you're a witness of that Jesus has suffered for you. And you will be a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. The qualifications are fairly good there. For this job that I'm going to call shepherd. Part two of the job description or the job offer here says uh, what this job is. And I believe that it's a call. Now twice in this, in this letter from Peter, I mean he's laid down a call for us. If you're a believer, you're called to certain things. And I believe that if you're a believer, you're called to be a shepherd. Now, you might want to push back on that one and say, oh, you know, I don't know. I don't know about a shepherd. I don't know. 
In the body of Christ, you are a shepherd. Think about shepherds. I want you to think about two things that shepherds are not. Shepherds are not cowboys. Now, I told you that Sue and I went out west a week ago on the plane, and it was a you know, great experience, except for security, which we won't go into that again. I'm just getting over it now. I still get a little sweaty when I think about it, but um, shepherds are not cowboys. How do cowboys herd cattle? They get behind them and they whistle and you know do all kind of make all kinds of noise. They push the cattle, right? They push the cattle. Now there might be somebody at the front to make sure there's nothing out front, but most of the cattle herding happens from the rear. That's not a shepherd. Shepherds are also not zookeepers. I don't think. Zookeepers try to keep the animals healthy. They teach them some tricks. Now you've got your own opinions, I'm sure, about the zoo. Make sure the animals get fed, but basically make sure they don't get out of captivity. Shepherds are not zookeepers. Shepherds have their own unique ways. And if you think about it, shepherding moves like a thread throughout all of Scripture. The only problem that we have is that there aren't too many shepherds outside the door, are there? Physical farming type shepherds. Now, if you get a chance to see one, you should go and talk to them. If they're a real shepherd, you should get a minute to shake their hand. COVID safely, I'm sure. Because their hands are so very soft. We're gonna we're gonna talk about that through Christmas through Christmas, I'm, I'm sure. We're gonna talk about shepherds and their role. But shepherds lead sheep. Shepherds were told, lay down their life for sheep. I don't know much about shepherds, but I know that they get the sheep into the sheepfold, and they've been known to lay down across the gate so that if a wolf comes, the wolf has to go past the shepherd to get to the sheep. Shepherds are a unique bunch. And what Peter is saying to you elders, remember who elders are, do I have to remember you? Well, older people, experienced people, people on the same faith page, and he says, shepherd, here's the call, shepherd the flock, which is among you. I know how many times I've discounted that word and thought about the church only. I don't want you to put a box around this this morning. Shepherd the flock that is among you. Okay, let's start here. Sure. Are there people here that you care about? You bet there are. Are there people here who you make some phone calls to once in a while, or you receive phone calls from? You bet you are. Shepherds. Thank you. Shepherds. Shepherding in the congregation is fairly cut and dried. Not that dry. It's a fairly easy ministry to see. It's looking after one another. It's leading other people. It's helping those who have less experience in the faith in whatever regard along, or peers who have the same experience in the faith, but are going through tough times that you've maybe been through. Shepherding has all kinds of forms and functions inside the congregation. And we're so blessed to have some amazing shepherds, all of you as amazing shepherds here in this place, because you care for each other. And we are joining you as fellow shepherds but I want you to think a little bit outside the sheepfold when Peter says, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Because I really want you to think about the people who you have some influence over. Did you realize that shepherding is an amazing parenting model? To shepherd your family? Now I realize that for many of you, your kids are grown up and gone. Maybe some of you have never had kids. You got nieces and nephews. But I'm saying there's amazing shepherding opportunities inside of your family. I had the amazing opportunity to shepherd one or maybe two of my kids this week. Just to listen to them, to hear them, to affirm them, to exhort them. Do you realize that you can be a shepherd inside your own family? Do you realize you can be a shepherd in some, inside your own neighborhood? Do you realize that there are people in your neighborhood who look towards you when they're wondering about what's going on in the world? 
if they know anything about you. Because if they know anything about you, they're going to know that you care about them somehow. They might not understand your faith, but I'll bet you they understand that you care. The shepherding ministry to those who are among you can happen there in your neighborhood, in your community, in your prayer circle, in the people you know about. See, shepherding has lots and lots of opportunities, not just inside the congregation, but there's some amazing ones there. No, I don't want to go on too long here, but there's the call to shepherding. Shepherding comes with some tasks, and without unpacking them too deeply, maybe we can do that another time under another category, but look at what it says in the second part of verse 2. How should I, how should I do this shepherding thing? What, is, what are my tasks? Well, there it is. Serve as overseers. An overseer is somebody that's paying attention. Have you ever not paid attention? And somebody checked you on it. You know, the conversation is going on and you're just kind of, you put on the deer in the headlights, sort of, you know, and you're just kind of, and you don't. And then, and then you realize that you haven't heard the last three sentences this person said. Because you were somewhere else. It's just me, right? It's just me. In chaplaincy, let me tell you, you have to teach yourself to listen. And listen well. Because it might just be a word, it might just be a phrase, it might just be a body language that somebody lets go of, and it tells you the whole story that you need to hear from this person that you're trying to care for. Serving as overseers means that we will try to listen carefully to one another. Not by compulsion, is the next line. I, I, that's, that's exactly what, I can't say much more about that. We don't want to be forced into this, but we want to be overseers and shepherds willingly. Maybe you've had jobs in your life that you didn't like, and you kind of had to resurrect yourself out of bed every morning and try to force yourself to get there. It's not the kind of thing that shepherding ought to be. Shepherding ought to be something that we do willingly. He goes on and says, not for dishonest gain. I love the old version. The good old King James Version here. Not for filthy lucre, but eagerly. See, shepherding isn't something that we should be forced to do. It should be something that we care about doing. Shepherding is, a, is all about compassion and empathy for others. Verse 3 goes on with the tasks of the shepherd. And like I said, you can see that we could spend a lot of time on any one of these. But it says, not lording it over them. That means not as a, a taskmaster or, or, or being that person who is, is, is forcing and manipulating and pushing and pushing. That's not a shepherd. The shepherding that we do with our family, with our, with our friends, with our, with our congregation, with our community. It's not about lording it over them. but to be examples to the flock. Now, there's a word that I really can't leave. I was going to, but I, I can't leave it. It says, to those entrusted to you. Don't be lords over those entrusted to you, but be examples to the flock. Do you hear what Peter's saying? That this isn't something that just sort of dropped out of the sky into your lap. That God himself has entrusted you with the call and the task of shepherding others. It's a God thing. And it's not really something I believe that is optional for you and I as believers. I believe that God has something, doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are as a believer, God has entrusted you with somebody to shepherd. There is somebody that God wants to bring into your airspace that only you can help. I believe it. It's how he works. It's how he's worked with me. Just the time I need it, God brings somebody into my airspace that can talk to me at a level, a mentoring level, a shepherding level that I need to hear. And sometimes the message from the shepherd is not an easy one. 
Sometimes it'll make you cry. But you probably won't be healed. The qualifications of the shepherd, elders who are among you, fellow elder, Peter says, <laughs> I'm coming as a fellow elder. The call to shepherding, so important that we hear it. The tasks of shepherding, so important that we unpack them in our own lives as to what they are. Well, what about the reward of shepherding? There's an ultimate reward, and it's a crown. I'll talk about it in a minute, but there's some immediate rewards too, aren't there? I hope I've told you this story. If I have, that means I'm an elder. I hope I've told you this story. And if I have, you just smile along and like you've never heard it before. But the, the, when I think about this concept, and I think about the concept of listening carefully as a shepherd, and I think about the reward, the immediate reward of shepherding. I think about the kid down the road there on Barton Street. I was standing talking to him, just a young guy. At the grill, we called it, they called it, at the grill, the, behind the bars. And as we talked a little bit back and forth, the next thing I noticed was the tears streaming down his face. And now I'm, I'm back where I was just a minute ago. Did I miss something? Did he say something I didn't hear? Was there something I should have been paying attention to? Did I say something that upset him in this regard? But he was weeping and, and, and having trouble controlling himself as the weep, weeping was, was coming up. And I said to him, did I, did I say something? I'm sorry, did I say something? And he said, no, 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 no. And he said, and don't. Don't make a big deal of this, he said. Long story short, it well, wasn't that long, but what he said to me was, it's the first time anybody's ever listened to me. Okay, so now I'm striking back with tears, and I didn't want anyone to see me crying. He knew that if he got caught crying, he would pay the price later that day for being weak. You see, the immediate reward of shepherd comes when you and someone else relate at that point of need, right? You know that God has sent you to this moment and what you're, what you're experiencing as a God moment as you help each other along. That's shepherding. And all of you are shepherds. But then the ultimate reward is spoken of right here. When the chief shepherd appears, that's Jesus. You because you're a shepherd, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. When Peter wrote these words down, there were all different types of crowns. There were crowns that you could get if you won the Olympics or some sporting event, made of flowers and vines. Those would, those would fade away. But the crown that he's talking about here is a crown of glory given to you by Christ himself that will not fade away. It will somehow distinguish you as a shepherd. And you're all shepherds. What do you do with crowns? Revelation 4.10 says, 24 elders fell down before him who sits on the throne. And worshipped him who lives forever and ever, and cast their crowns, laid them down, cast their crowns before the throne, saying, simple words, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist. Sang it earlier. We fall down. We lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of his mercy and love laid down at the feet of Jesus. Now we're going to quiet our hearts just for a moment. Allow God's word to just sit and rest in us. Sylvia is going to help us on the piano with this song. We've been thinking about your ministry as a shepherd to those around you. 
those who are in your sphere of influence. This song has verses that begin this way. It says, the Savior of men came to seek and to save the souls who were lost to the good. That's, that's shepherding. His spirit was moved by the world which he loved with the boundless compassion of God. Still there are fields where the laborers are few. Still there are souls without bread. Still eyes that weep where the darkness is deep. And still myriad straying sheep to be led. Except thy love and compassion, the song says. We're just going to whisper these words out as you will, and to allow God to, to speak through us, uh, speak in us, and minister to us as we sing these songs. Just uh, the first verse, please. The Savior of men came to seek and to save the souls who were lost in the good. His Spirit was Lift up verse two and then we'll have a prayer together. Consider how we can shepherd those among us. Whether they be in a congregation or a community, whether they be in a family, 
We're in a place where we just know that people know who we are and what we stand for. Lord, help us to be about that ministry of shepherding. Help us to be about that ministry in a way that causes those who want to know to hear. Causes those who have questions to ask. Causes those who are struggling to seek refuge. And as we shepherd from the floor, as we shepherd in the midst of those that we care about, will you strengthen us and equip us? Will you cause us to realize that this is your call on our lives? And that we need to be about the business of getting that done. Each day, will you give us opportunity in Jesus' name. Amen. The closing verse of the song, the closing verse of our morning this morning, it is not with might to establish the right, nor yet with the wise to give rest. The mind cannot show what the heart wants to know. See, there, there are people among you, people, the, 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 the people among you. The shepherding ministry takes place among you. Let's pay attention to what he's calling us to do today. Third verse. Before we do that, I'm going to pronounce the benediction. We've got this song, and uh, you know, you can stay or you can go. It's all up to you. But here's the benediction for today. When the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the crown of glory. It will not fade away.